Good morning, everyone. This is a rare treat. I am Ann White, the founder of the Creating Calm Network, and I'm here with Louise Moriarty, typically one of the gals down under. Good morning, Louise. Good morning, Ann. And Louise is somewhere in the mountains in Colorado. God knows why, and we will find out. What are you doing on a walkabout in America? You are so amazing. You are a single woman with your backpack walking about Colorado and who knows where else. What's the story? Well, the story is, I guess the story is I love Ken Stone. And so he had an embodied messenger experience. A retreat like. Yeah, which was in Fort Collins. And it was really, it's interesting because I've just recently in Boulder also um, experienced something called circling, which was very beautiful. And it's very much just being with people and letting them be really, like reflecting back to them what's going on for them and them talking about what they're actually feeling. And someone described it as the Vipassana with communication. So, you know, being okay with whatever comes up and just observing it and letting it run its course kind of thing. But you're in a group and kind of one person gets circled by the other people. So, you know, the focus is kind of on one person to have an, have their experience fully seen and acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that was it was beautiful. It was at this place called the Integral Centre in Boulder and this Integral Centre is this most extraordinary building with lovely spaces for meditation and, and groups together. And so when we did the circling process, I thought, oh, gee, actually that's what we've kind of been doing with Ken the last few couple of times we've come to America. You know, there is that sense of people being seen in the group and people have the opportunity to express within a group exactly what they're feeling and where they're at and, you know, what what's actually going on for them and trying to keep it really in the present moment. Mm -hmm. Even though you know, sometimes it drops into talking about what you're doing in your, you know, in your career or in your family or in your world, but very much about, you know, what the interaction is that's occurring right there, right now in the room. So, um, yeah, so I, I came initially to go and hang out with Ken again and he had a group of about, I think it was like 35 or 40 odd people. Wow. And, um, yeah, and it was amazing because, you know, you can imagine the diversity of experiences, even though everyone came with the, with the thought of finding out more about how they're going to deliver their message because everyone in the group was, is kind of working in that field. You know, they have a message. Each of the messages is very specific to the person's background, life, history, journey. And, um, you know, having that many diverse realities in the room, as you can imagine, sometimes it brought up conflict, sometimes it brought up, you know, just uncomfortableness with different people's way of handling the things that come up in their own lives. But it was a beautiful experience of just being able to be with and let other people be. Mm -hmm. So the whole trip has kind of uh, encompassed that theme, I think. I feel like I'm circling around the planet. <laughs> and, and, you know, in many ways you are. So when you left this seminar, this retreat, mm. you went on and you did some poetry slamming, some couch surfing. I saw the picture of you being driven into town in a cop car. I mean, <laughs> yeah. They weren't escorting you out of town. Um, no, but the ironic thing was they were escorting me. Well, they, they, were, they were escorting me to Ken's conference, believe it or not, because I landed at 3.30 in the morning on the outskirts of Fort Collins somewhere and started walking in the snow, in my first snow. And, um, you know, and I, this policeman stopped me. Obviously, they like stopping people and talking to them. And, um, you know, he realised that I didn't know where I was going or what I was doing. <laughs> So he offered to give me a lift somewhere. And when I got in the car, like, we don't have guns like that in Australia. You know, they, I mean, really, you don't see modern rifles or shotguns anywhere, or I don't. And um, the only place we see them is in toy shops. So to me, they just look like these crazy toy guns, but obviously they weren't. And when I asked him, why do you need them? He said, oh, there's a lot of crazy people up in those hills there who don't like people. And I was like, Mm, I wonder why they don't like people. You're driving around with all these guns. <laughs> they have guns too, but... <laughs> yeah, and so ironically, he was kind of heading me closer into the direction of the crazy people up in the hills, which is where I am now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'm up in Netherland now, and uh, the Frozen Dead Guy Day Festival is on. It's kind of the middle of that this weekend. So and they've been having... Festival? Tell us... Um... I don't know about that festival, the Frozen Dead Guy Festival. 
Yeah, basically, um, there was this uh, guy whose father wanted to be cryogenically frozen and they were from Norway, I think. Yeah, I think they were Norwegian. And um, they and so they ended up with him here frozen and no one in town knew. And so this guy was a bit of a character in town. He kind of created the polar bear plunge day and, you know, where they jump in the ice for the breaking of spring sort of thing. And he was quite a controversial figure anyway, like he was quite outspoken. Mm -hmm. He made a joke about hijacking the airport and, um, you know, when they said you can't say that here, he went, I'm in America, I can say anything and got arrested for, you know, continuing on with his hijacking joke or whatever. So he was already quite a controversial, or not controversial, but, a, you know, a big kind of character mm -hmm. in town. Anyway, he finally got deported because he didn't have the right blue card or whatever. And when he left, um, they found these bodies in this crazy... Uh, shockproof house castle bunker that he built and um there was two bodies one was someone who paid to be cryogenically frozen i think they were from michigan or somewhere and they when they found that body they sorted that out with the family and sent it back and said we don't know if we're going to do this kind of thing here but then his father the um his grandfather it was his daughter was still here and it all went to court and you know and the whole town was in a kind of do we want this or not? And eventually the whole town, well, not the whole town, but the majority of people came around to going, well, whatever. It's just some dead guy in the hills. It's not like he's doing any harm to anyone. Mm -hmm. He's not, you know, running around annoying anyone or getting drunk and causing <laughs> havoc. <clears throat> not toting guns, yep. He's, he's pretty harmless and maybe it's a good thing. It's already caused, you know, got the town on the map kind of thing because by now international media have picked up on the story and all this. And he was frozen, but... He wasn't really being looked after that well. And so they ended up employing an ice man who worked for 16 years or something, keeping him frozen. So he's been here quite a long time now. And so then the whole town kind of went, what a great idea for a festival. You know, it's, the, uh, it's our unique selling point, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> and so yesterday there was a polar bear plunge where people jumped in the ice. And, you know, it's, it's very significant to people. There was... Um, and, like, this year's festival is in honour of two other people who've passed away recently. Mm -hmm. One of them, a fairly young guy, who was quite well known from the festival, like he'd been a VIP at the festival three times and he loved the polar bear plunge and he was a real, you know, kind of dress-up character. And so, like, his whole family's here this year. To, he passed away and his whole family's here this year to scatter his ashes and his younger sister is going to do all the events in honour of him and, you know, so it's quite brought up this this significance for people for different people for different reasons and well, you know you come from australia to be at the dead guy festival <laughs> frozen dead guy festival <laughs> but you know yeah. sounds like you're having a fun time and um I got to, I mean, some of the things, the other things they have, like yesterday they had a parade of hearse through town and they had a coffin racing thing and they had frozen turkey bowling where they use a frozen turkey for the bowling ball. And so there's all these other things going on. And today we've got a dead poet slam. So a bunch of us will be representing dead poets and slamming for them, <laughs> going into competition for them. And... um but the other thing that I got to do, they have a blue ball on Friday night where lots of people were dressed up as dead guys, you know, frozen dead guys. <laughs> and um, so I got to write poems for people there and I said that I would write poems from their dead guys to them. So I had some hilarious, I mean, I had some, you know, there was another guy there who his mate had been in an accident recently and he'd been looking after him for the last six or eight weeks or something. Mm -hmm. And he recently, he passed away last week. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote a poem from that dead guy to his mate, which his mate just was so touched by. But I also got to write a poem from Elvis to Elvis because ah. Elvis was there. <laughs> Someone else wanted me to write a poem from, uh, what is his name? Geronimo oh. to Custer. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I got to write some hilariously fabulous poems and some very sentimental, heartfelt, touching love poems for people from their boyfriends and different, you know, sister poems for sisters. And, mm. and you know, when I first met Louise, we've known each other now probably about four years, Louise, since we first yeah. met in um, the retreat in Baltimore. 
And I asked what your goal or your dream was, and you once said to write a poem for every person on the planet. And yeah. you know, girl, <laughs> you're getting there. <laughs> poems within Colorado, that's for sure. Yeah, and if you like, if you do look at my, I've got a Facebook page called the Poet Louise Moriarty, and you can see, like, especially when I was first in Boulder, like, I wrote some for the pizza guys and for the people in the bong shop and for people in the art shop and people in the jigsaw puzzle shop. Boulder's got the best jigsaw puzzles. If you love jigsaw puzzles, check out the Boulder jigsaw puzzle shop. They are absolutely exquisite. They have the most freakiest, freakiest shape pieces mm -hmm. and they, the art on them is just extraordinary. So it's just been such a magical journey of finding treasures like that, you know, like just little quirky places along the way. And that's why in this sense, you know, I'm starting a series, but it's always in my mind, people you should know. And you are one of those people people should know because here you are, you are a single woman, and you let life unfold in front of you because I know you didn't have a lot of planning when you came. You planned to come to Kenzie Dent. And yeah. did you plan to come to the Frozen Dead Guy event too? Yeah, okay, I did. So that, but that was before. very loose as well. Like yeah. that was, that's still very loose and we're in the middle of it. <laughs> you have no place to stay, you know, when you start your journey. So it unfolds before you. You find places. I remember there was one night on Facebook you said you hadn't found a place yet, and it's freezing, and you're out there with your backpack, and yet it all turns out. So well, I'll tell you a secret, Anne. My backpack was probably stashed at the Poetry Cafe or at somewhere. Okay. I'm very lucky, like, you know, even in that sense, like when I landed in Boulder, a snowstorm was just coming in, mm -hmm. and the person who gave me a lift, you know, the night before the lift got organised, it was someone from Ken's event, but it wasn't till the night before I put it up on Facebook, and she went, oh, I'm going to Boulder for work. Yeah. And, of course, she drops me off right in front of a cafe she's never been to, but it happens to be a poetry cafe. So <laughs> perfect. I wrote poems for everyone there and they let me leave my backpack there while I kind of went on little reconnaissance missions. And and even, like, the, the house I'm actually staying at now, um, it's a woman who I'd previously contacted on couch surfing, but she'd gone, oh, no, there's a lot going on here now. You know, I'm not sure if I want to want someone to stay but we kept in communication and then she'd offered to give me a lift up the hill and because the house where someone else had organized for me to stay was just is just up the road from her oh, she kind of took me there to drop me off and then she went oh actually you know I think you'd be really good at our house maybe you won't want to stay at this crazy chaotic anarchist house you might want to stay at our house why don't you come back to our house and so then I ended up here but I've also been um oh. Up at the Love Shovel Ranch, which is a crazy, chaotic, anarchist, poetry, artist kind of retreat place, um, they have like a big pasta night every week, so I've been able to go to that. And, you know, they have a summer writing school as well. So there's a possibility if you're like some edgy, out-of-the-box kind of poet or writer and you want somewhere to retreat to in the summer to do your writing, the Love Shovel Ranch is a pretty wild place if you like living on the edge of wildness. <laughs> and it is in the wild. And, and you do. And, you know, you squeeze every ounce of life out. You know, it's just you are an amazing, inspiring person because so many people are afraid to travel or don't leave their comfort zone. And of course, maybe your comfort zone is the whole universe. But the fact that you can just let life unfold and meet people and just it, it, you really enjoy every every molecule of life you have i love that to go to i have to tell you another funny story yeah. on the way home from the ball the other night like i was wandering back from the tent we're wandering up first street with this girl and she's just gorgeous and she's the she's doing the marketing for the first one she's running the pirate radio you know like so she's got lots of skills and she's just, seen, you know, to me, she just seems like someone who'd be way out there and feel incredibly safe and go for it. And she does. Like, she runs the pirate radio and she's doing all this great work for the festival. And then, um, and so they interviewed me on the radio. And then, you know, it was probably maybe one in the morning or something. And I'm like, well, I'm going to walk up the hill now. And she was just, like, mortified. And then we kept talking and hanging around. And then she suddenly went, oh. Just before you go, though, can I offer you one thing? And I thought she was going to offer me drugs because this is Colorado, yeah. land of the legalised marijuana kind of thing, recreational marijuana. So, the, you know, there's a lot of people 
trying things and a lot of recreational tourists, you know. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, oh, you know, I just want you to, please, can I offer you this one thing to take with you? And she's like, do you want some pepper spray? And I was like thinking, pepper spray? Like I was thinking it was some kind of drug. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that you should take before you go up the hill because it'll keep you warm and make you happy or something. <laughs> but she was talking about Psh, pepper spray for animals <laughs> yeah. and people. But she was, you know, really like gorgeous, gave me gloves, gave me, you know, everything. A torch, gave me pepper spray to make sure I'd be safe on my journey up the hill. And it's just like, I don't know, people just want you to be safe. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I saw a picture of you on Facebook where everybody had given you clothes. You had leg warmers from somebody. From somebody. <laughs> well, that, actually, all those clothes were actually from Australia, but oh. they were from all my different friends in Australia. So it's oh, okay, there. so you brought those with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> and even my ski boots, they were like five bucks at the Chugan Op Shop at the beach. Go figure. We don't get snow ever. But there happened to be this $5 pair of fabulous, fabulous, fluffy, furry, gorgeous boots that I <laughs> carried around for no apparent reason except for when I got here and it was snowing, I was so grateful for those boots. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It was worth carrying them to the end. Well, I'm really sorry that your journey isn't going to bring you to Chicago and Sheboygan because I'm in a poetry group here and I was kind of hoping to share you with everybody. But you know what, Louise? Who knows, you may be back. Who knows what will happen as you travel around the globe. And do you know what's really funny? The la There's been three people I've met kind of overnight and t today, or not overnight, yesterday, and um, they all came from Chicago. And I was like, am I supposed to be asking them for a lift? <laughs> maybe, maybe. So you never know what will happen yet. <laughs> yeah. So from here, you're gonna are you gonna spend some time in San Francisco, or just head on the plane back home when you go? You've got about another what week here? A week yeah, in America? Another week. <clears throat> um, I quite are like it here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I quite like it here too. Um, and I've met you know like I've it's been quite a busy journey, and there's been lots of people I've met who I go it would be lovely to spend some. You know, a day hiking in the mountain or, you know, just a day where we don't have anything to chill out and relax a bit. So um, we'll see what happens. But there are some and, – and also, I mean, the other reason – or wasn't a reason I came here, but something I found out about while I was here was the Naropa University. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't know about that, it's um, – it's this very kind of embodied mindfulness university. So it was set up by some Rinpoche, I think, who – had studied at Harvard or one of those kind of more elite universities and he was like, this is great. My academic career has been powered up no end, but it doesn't touch on any of those other areas of being embodied, being mindful, being compassionate, all that end of the scale. And so he set up this university called Naropa. Next to the internet. And, um, yeah, they have a lot of quite beautiful courses and they also have the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetica, which is, you know, a writing school. And they also have an amazing summer school coming up this year. So it's a four-week thing. You can do weeks or you can do the whole four weeks. Um, so, yeah, I'm very, you know, I've been very interested in finding out more than more about that. And I got to sit in on a class this week with a guy called Jack Callum, who is a published poet that you may have heard of but his class was just all the people in the group have been going out into the community and refuges of folks home schools uh, shelters different places have been doing poetry workshops with people and so you know they were all there feeding back about their experience of going into community and reading work that people had written from around the area so that was just you know right on point for me to uh, have an experience of that class. It was really perfect. But Naropa also does a lot of art therapy, eco-psychology, environmental, um, you know, adventure kind of therapy, get out in the wild therapy, that kind of stuff. Why don't you so, get them to hire you so that you can go <laughs> teach some of your circus tried poetry slam magic? Indeed, indeed. Yeah, so well, I'd, I'd be just as happy as they let me came along to the summer school because I really want to get a handle on what they're doing, you know, because I feel like, I mean, I know I love what I'm doing and what I'm doing is great, but I feel like they just have this range of teachers who come from all different disciplines and, you know, lots of people with shamanic kind of backgrounds and traditions and different people who come at it 
from you know lots of different angles so I'm just fascinated by their whole course of study like it's quite extraordinary and to have that real mindfulness element to it it's really beautiful mm. tell me why uh, you know your mission of writing poems for everyone that that must feed you in a sense as it feeds everyone else because they're so uh, it's such a gift that you oh give my people. god and the hugs I get it's worth it now. <laughs> Because you touch people's soul with your poems. I mean, they're not just roses are red, violets are blue. I mean, you really somehow are intuitive or connect that you can touch people's inner core with your poetry. Well, it's funny because me and Mel were talking yesterday and just going, well, you know, it's more like an oracle or it's more like, like I don't know what word to use to describe it because it is really, it, it fascinates me every time and I, brings me immense sense of doing what I'm here to do <laughs> when yeah. I do my poems and when I read them to them and see their reaction and they are so grateful for being seen. I do get a sense that it is, you know, it's like an oracle. It is definitely, it's like seeing inside their soul or something and I've been thinking about it a lot lately just, I don't know, you know, that sense of where the boundaries are between us, like everyone's talking about oneness. Mm -hmm to let ourselves have the experience of what that actually means for us is, I guess, is a lot of people's mission at the moment because they all are talking about the theory of it and they're trying to find a way to put oneness into practice. And I know for a lot of people when they go, how do you do that? How did you nail the details of my life? And I'm just like, well, you know, go figure. I don't actually know how I do it. But I do know that other people can walk into a room and we all do it. Like, Check it out when you do it because we do it um, subconsciously right now. Every single one of you will walk into a room, scan that room, and I mean scan it. Like you check out every single person in that room. You walk a particular way because you want to walk closer to some people and further away from other people. You will strike up a conversation with one, not the other, because you trust them more, because you've scanned them and gone, this is how much trust I want to have with them. This is how much interaction I am willing to have with them. I think they'll be a nice person. I think they connect with me at this. You know, like even that sense of scanning the room going, oh, that person's like me. We've got similarities. We've got familiarities or something. And you will edge towards them and you'll be willing to talk to them if they stand at the bar next to you or at the counter next to you. And even, you know, to the point of looking behind the diner window and seeing all the chefs out there and people, you straight away scan them all and go, oh, he looks nice. Oh, <laughs> He looks like it'd be funny to have a conversation. She looks interesting. You know, like you, you totally get them. Somewhere you get them from your worldview, viewpoint, whatever, but you get them at some level already. Your intuition, your interconnection with them is already fully broadcasting to you what you need to know for you to make the moves you need to make, you know, the moves you need to make. Yeah, so that is probably a beginning and if we could all tap into that, you know, one of the things about you in the way that you have sort of surrendered to the oneness, um, you, you've maybe taken down barriers. Do you think, because I'm trying to think how you're able to move so freely without what, at least in America, many of us have fear. You know, I'm afraid to go to that scary mountain. I'm afraid to go in here where I don't know. Um, how, it's something you've done intuitively, so you may not be able to even answer the question. No, but I, don't, I really don't think it is intuitively because I think that's been fed and nurtured all my life. Yeah. Like it's a viewpoint, you know. It is definitely like when we were kids, we would go camping every year, you know. Like my parents nurtured that. They were Boy Scouts or whatever, you know. Like so they would nurture that sense of you can handle yourself in the wild. Not that, you know, we were probably at a campground, let's face it, but there was a sense of you know how to light a fire, you know how to, you know, I don't know, whatever it is. There was a sense of you are competent in this environment. And I think and, the la with that belief, you are, with that belief. You know, where someone had the belief that I'm afraid to walk down the street and your belief is, hey, no worries, man, the one who is afraid is probably going to get mugged, whereas you are going to go through, you know, all sorts of wonder, uh, unusual places because your belief system is that you're okay. Everything is fine. Also, I have 
continuously throughout my life put myself into what other people would see as dangerous situations. Yeah, yeah. Or communities or environments. All of a sudden you took a turn down the street and I'm thinking, I'm not following her. And there you were having this glorious time, what I thought was a dangerous street. And you mm. and Mel were just having a good walkabout. So you must have a certain radar or a, a aura or something that allows but you to break boundaries. I also think it comes back to that thing of... I'm not really sure how to explain it because it's funny because I just got a letter today from someone who is quite dear to me who's just been put in jail in something quite terrible. And um, even in that sense of where people are doing terrible things, like it's definitely, you know, part of that heart, al heart alchemy cosmology about everyone wants to be loved, wants to belong and wants to feel safe. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, they've chosen to believe it will make them safe or it will fulfill their view of the world if they go out and whatever it is they do, you know, be a terrorist or whatever it is, you know, like I'm just using extreme examples now. But, you know, for those people who we look at and go, oh, they're terrorists, terrible people, terrorists, terrible people, we should be fearful of them. They're actually just trying to keep themselves and their family safe. And they believe, from whatever reason, that's the only way to do it. And it works somewhere. It works for them, just like all our beliefs. We think we think they work for us, and they do. They feed us. They feed what we think is the truth about oh, life. Exactly. That is true. We feed on our own beliefs. So mm. if we were to start changing our thinking, we could then surrender to the world and expand our life experience if we choose. I think of mm. so many people like my parents spent their life in their easy chairs. You know, yeah. the, recliner they sat there they had the remote control on the TV and that was their life and, and you know I, I so resist that even my brother and I we do not have televisions we don't have easy chairs because you got to get out of your chair you know to find life I don't know if you know people like that who just live their whole life just sitting in their easy chair you know yeah and I think I think that's the beautiful thing about looking at everyone as a living master because that worked for our parents or for whoever. You that me. made them feel safe, it made them feel like they belonged and it made them feel loved. You know, like that's what they created, that's the bubble of reality they created around them that made them feel like the world was a good place, was a place where they could exist happily. <laughs> and even if people look miserable, somewhere we're happy with our misery. We've chosen to be in that, you know, we choose that because it works for us. It makes the and world. And we become teachers. Like I have learned what I don't want from miserable people or from my parents who stayed in the bubble. So they became teachers for what we do want. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting when you say choice too because a lot of us, it was really interesting when I was just um, reading my friend's letter, kind of confessing and lamenting for being bad you know and saying he's going to change it but it's something about where we're it just feels like we're all when we're trying to change things we're trying to change them from somewhere where it doesn't affect it like we're trying to change it up here not i don't know yeah i'm not sure what i'm trying to say but there is that sense of like when we're beating ourselves up making ourselves wrong making other people right blah 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 we don't connect with where what we've actually already done worked for us mm -hmm. and we don't have the gratitude and the willingness to be with and be in whatever it is we're operating from or whatever it is we're you know if we're manipulating people if we're playing games if we're controlling people whatever we're doing that works for us and there's no reason to change it if it works for you let it be you know but by being with it and being grateful for that and recognizing where we are living masters and we've created reality from that powerful place and it actually served us and worked for us then we're able to in the next moment take a full present choice right. but it feels like most people are kind of trying to push something away or shun something or beat themselves up with the flogging whip for being so bad and somewhere that's not honoring the power of that creation right. because somewhere that creation made you feel like the world made sense. <laughs> I mean, and I know it's not our typical idea of safety, but I think the funny thing I've been learning from playing in the living master realm, going, I'm a living master, woo <laughs> is that, um, you know, we are all the most powerful beings. Like whatever is happening for us where we actually are in charge of it, like somewhere we are, there's things we 
you know, like we don't know. We don't know why. But that doesn't mean that this moment we can't take our power back and make a choice from a very self-aware place. I just I always think about those living masters going, um, you know, on about self-awareness mm -hmm. going, you know, know thyself. That's the key. And um, the other thing in the world, like, you know, if people are operating in all kinds of spheres, then all you can do is come back to yourself and go, well, if this wasn't about them, what does it mean to me? You know, like if your mum and dad are sitting in the armchair watching telly, like you said, it's not about telling them to be different or, you know, whatever, judging their way of being in the world. It's about coming back and going, well, what does that mean for me? It means I don't want to sit in an armchair. So what am I doing? I'm sitting here trying to, you know, <laughs> manipulate and change them. I've got to get out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, you know, when I, I think about you too, and when I think about my own spiritual or my own human growth, I guess, part of it is being open. Part of it is being centered. There, there's no order in this. Centered. And then part of it is surrendering to the unfolding of life in the moment. Um, you know, those are the things that at least are resonating with my conversation with you and with my practice. Because if I'm not, a lot of times I wasn't grounded. So I had to really find my own grounding before that I could open and surrender or else just blow away. <laughs> and it's that hilarious thing too of surrender in each moment. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, I've surrendered, I've surrendered, I've been surrendering all friggin' week. Why aren't I finding a place to stay tonight? Why would they, what? I'm sure these people said yesterday when I was surrendering and they were loving me up and they were going to stay here anytime and now they're saying I can't stay here. What's their problem? You know, like it, the surrender doesn't just have a once and then right. like, oh, the angels are singing and everything clicks into place. It is like every moment surrender, every moment surrender, every moment, you know, and just when you're on that high and feeling like you're in the flow and all the cosmic energies are aligned and la, and then the next minute you feel like, oh, I don't know what's going on. Or I don't, it's not that I don't feel well, but I just don't know. I don't feel quite, uh, but it's like, well, can you be with that? Okay, this is, your this is the next moment. Be with that. Forget about this. Forget about that. Don't judge it up against this or that or the other. You know, like, it, and I particularly find that I think the more I feel like I'm standing in my power and the more I am, you know, out there in the world, giving my gifts, receiving from people, you know, having this amazing interactions, the more when things are just a bit slow or settled or there's not much happening, the more challenging it is for me to go, I surrender to this moment and I'm willing to be with me in this moment and let that moment be and not try and manipulate that or force myself into some other energetic mm -hmm. because all those energetics, no matter whether, you know, what kind of scale they're on, they're all you being a living master in the present moment. So to be able to be with them and embrace them is the thing. <laughs> is the thing. Yeah, well, on that segue, I'm going to just do a little steer the bus here. And you have a circus tribe, too, that reminded me of, and, you know, the first time I met Louise, she was teaching us how to juggle. And it, your line, I've never forgotten it, when juggling, or uh, she said, the key is knowing when to let go. Uh -huh. <laughs> the line I've carried with you, because I think that's so <laughs> found in life, is that the key is knowing when to let go. But you taught it through juggling. And uh -huh. I think that sometimes you teach kids or corporate gurus through yeah. letting go by letting their circus kid come out. Yeah, absolutely. I do love circus and I always think about it as the first global tribal culture on the planet, like that sense of, you know, even with circus there was still that thing of either everyone ate or no one ate or, you know, if there was food, people ate, everyone pitches in to put up the tent, everyone has their part to play in the show. Mm -hmm. You know, it is very tribal in nature and even now, you know, there's that sense of you can travel anywhere and meet people and put to sh put a show together and make some money or, you know, entertain people or bring a message. So I really value having been part of that community or being a part of that community in the world. It's very exciting. You know, I just feel your energy today. I think any of these writing schools or poetry schools we're talking about, they need to have you come as a scholar in residence. <laughs> um, you know, you need to be transported all over the world to teach people the beauty of um, the spontaneity. Well, and, and I'd love on that note to leave people with an exercise. Okay. Um, 
It's just a writing exercise that I love and it really connects to what I do with people where I write poems for people. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got something that you love, like an object that you love or, you know, just a trinket or a treasure or if you've got some piece of jewellery that belonged to someone special or, you know, that has significance mm -hmm. and, or just even a crystal or a rock or a feather or, you know, something from nature that you feel, <laughs> um, write it. Hold it in your hand and write it and you'll be amazed. <laughs> you will be amazed. Oh. You know, just, you know, go act as if you are that thing writing. Oh, write it as though you were that thing. Kind of. I mean, you can say it in lots of different ways. It'll mean different things to different people, yeah. but let that thing write through you or... Oh. You know, I mean, if that doesn't resonate for you, just look at it and start writing about what it looks like and then right. that go where it goes, whatever way it works for you. Mm -hmm. But there is a real sense of giving yourself freedom to express whatever comes. And I don't know, I always find that exercise extraordinary because the message, like it could be your guru speaking to you, you know. <laughs> Or it, it can be your great aunt if you've got your great aunt's wedding ring or, you know, like you can get a direct message from a benevolent part of the universe that cares from you through that exercise. That's my feeling anyway. And I often say to people when they ask me about my poetry, how I do it, I often say that that was kind of the seed for doing it. Like we did a, a shamanic journeying workshop and we had to hold a crystal and write the crystal. And what message came back to me was like, you know, I felt like I'd channeled the universe, my guardian angel, <laughs> you know, like they were telling me straight, like how they saw me and how I am in the world and, you know, maybe a little bit of advice, but, you know, more just the affirmation and the acknowledgement of who you are in the world. And I find that's very strong in the poetry as well. And very much in the poetry, the boundary dissipates because, Whatever I write for the other person, I don't feel like it could come out unless I saw that part of me as well. Mm -hmm. So it does feel very much like a direct reflection or, you know, wherever the boundaries are blurred between us, that's what I see or what I'm able to communicate. You have a poem in you today. I always have a poem in me. <laughs> I could spend, and I, and I, I mean, our conversation or one of where you're staying or um, can you give us one of your poetry slams? Slam us with a poem. Yeah, I just want to say too, in the past when people lived in tribes, that's what they did. They sung the song lines. I know there's, an, there's a story also about in Africa where when a mother got pregnant, she would, or before even maybe, she would go out into the forest or the savanna or whatever and um, she would wait for the heart song of that child to come and she would sing that child's heart song and then at all the significant moments of that child's life she would sing their heart song mm -hmm. and I very much think, you know, the poet, something in our language, we've lost that poetry. You know, even in Old English thing, there was the bards who sung the stories and the songs of how life goes. So, yeah. So here we are with Anne today on the radio. She's far away, but all of you and me can connect. And through our heart songs, our love will be protected. Each moment we can visualise how we see the world through new eyes, make a choice for our free will so that we don't have a, to pay a big bill <laughs> because life isn't a test. Life is just for us to do our best and whatever it is that we do, that is us being ourselves true. Each moment we don't need any agenda. We don't need to act like a pretender. We can just sit in our bliss and let every connection be an eternal kiss with life's energies full and strong. This is the way we sing our heart song. All the animals and all the trees, watch them. They know how to be. Each new interaction we play takes us into the miracle and wonder of each day. And so if nothing more you get, it is. Just let go and forget because what you need to know is exactly in this moment it's natural for us to grow change will come it is true and it will come because of what you do there is no doubt you don't have to push and shout just let it be you can be free to have this moment in all its grace and serenity <laughs> I, I, 
yeah, you know, as I'm enjoying your words and kind of think, where are they coming from? Mm -hmm. You know, you could get another career as a rap artist. <laughs> I just, I also think. Oh, it's so beautiful, me, Louise. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to write it down when I play yeah. it again, too. I just think, too, there's that sense of we all have our light bulb moments. We all know where we get our deep inner knowing from. And I don't want to say it's deep because sometimes it's not. Sometimes it is like, it was it Alchemies or whoever when he jumped in the bathtub and went Eureka? I figured out how to measure the volume of the body in the water. You know, he, it, it's like it's in the, it is in the moments where we let ourselves be that the grandest intuitions or the, and it's not even the grandest or the simple, it's simple. It's so simple. And that's why me and Mel talk about miracles, um, you know, all the miracles and wonder stuff and the perfect present being about having an effortless life. Mm -hmm. because you do not have to force or push anything. It is a space to let things be. And in that space, amazing things come forth. Yeah. And when you open the door or when you allow it, like just recently in my home, which I call the Enchanted Cottage and Chicken Farm, yeah. I actually I feel like I've stepped into my authenticity um, in a beautiful way. And now that the doors are open, all these blessings are rushing in. They're just rushing in with blessings. And it's kind of amazing. I mean, I'm loving the journey. And yeah. I, I try to stay in the moment, but I think it had to be stepping into your authenticity mm. or owning it or something happened. Mm. Or maybe Beautiful. moving to Sheboygan. Who knows? Got to move to Sheboygan. 